In June, 53-year-old Mark Sewell from Barry was jailed for 14 years after being found guilty of eight historic sex offences. The judge at Merthyr Crown Court said Sewell had used his position of power as an elder in the Jehovah's Witnesses to exploit and abuse women and children. It's a paedophile's paradise because of the way the two-witness rule protects the, pa the paedophile, the sex abuser, over and above that of the child. There have been 25 similar convictions in Jehovah's Witness congregations across the UK in the last four years. Tonight, two of Mark Sewell's victims talked to Wales this week, claiming that the organisation has kept allegations of abuse hidden. Alarm bells should have been ringing after more than one person had named Mr Sewell. he had done stuff previous to other people. I don't know whether they think they're outside of the law or whether they just don't want the law finding out about what's going on. If you're prepared to die for your flock, I think you should be prepared to come to court for your flock. It's been described as the greatest preaching campaign the world has ever known. Jehovah's Witnesses are a close-knit community of evangelical Christians well known for going door-to-door, -door, handing out literature about their faith. They do not have blood transfusions, serve in the military, celebrate Christmas or birthdays. But now claims are emerging from some past and present members of the church that there may be a pattern of sex abuse that the organisation has not only failed to report, but has actually helped to keep from the authorities. He would sort of lay next to me and pull me up on top of him. Um, he would get into bed with me in the night wearing just his underpants. He came into the bathroom when I was in the shower. Karen Morgan was 12 when Mark Sewell started abusing her. She reported it to her parents, but she was told she had misunderstood her uncle's affections. They didn't like to think that somebody who supposedly loves Jehovah would be doing things like that to me. Karen and her family were members of the Kingdom Hall in Barry. As another member of the congregation, Mark Sewell was not only a brother to them in church terms, he also became a real member of the family after he married Karen's aunt. It went without saying, I guess, that, that I became close to Mark. I used to stay over their house every Thursday night. Most weekends we would all be at their house. It was when she was about 12 or 13, she told me that she didn't like the way Mark was kissing her. I simply thought that she meant he was being a bit over-friendly, touching, kissing when we got there or when we left. Um, so the whole thing went over my head. A few months later, she said to me again, she didn't like the way Mark was kissing her. On both occasions, I actually went to see Mark and said, do you mind toning down the, um, the affection? Because Karen's probably a bit embarrassed. I had no idea that what she was actually trying to say was that there was something more going on. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the Bible is the literal translation of God's word. It says when a brother has sinned, you should first confront him before going elsewhere. Karen was now in a particularly awkward situation. She had to face Sewell in a series of meetings at his home. It was really embarrassing to have to sit in front of my auntie and my mum and dad and him. So I just kept it quite brief. Um, and he, he just sat there and said, oh no, she's lying or no, she's misunderstood that. With no one fully grasping what was happening to her, the abuse continued for another two years. I was 16. I was a mess by this point. I was um, self-harming. I was still going to meetings three times a week. Um, and two of those meetings, him and my auntie, were there. Mark and Cora are two former Jehovah's Witnesses who now campaign to give a voice to victims like Karen. Based in Cheltenham, the couple helped launch Advocates for the Awareness of Watchtower Abuses, or AWA. The Watchtower is the Jehovah's headquarters in New York. Mark and Cora feel the church is instilling a culture of undue influence, which violates the basic human rights of its members, especially in the protection of children. 
we are trying to change the whole whole policy of the way that they look at the individual that's being accused because this is somebody that can continue to carry on abusing people. They don't see it as a crime. No. They see it as a sin. They see it as a weakness of that person. The couple say it was only through the campaign that they started to become aware of the scale of what was really happening. The same story was being repeated around the world. The secrecy surrounding any allegations of abuse, of molestation or rape, were, are so tightly controlled by the organisation that um, most Jehovah's Witnesses, your average witness, does not know anything about it. Each congregation is served by a body of elders who are there to help, guide and protect the hundred-strong congregation. In the two years that Karen was being abused, businessman Sewell had been made a church elder. He was now in a position of considerable trust, making it much harder for Karen to be believed. It was only when she decided to write it all down that eventually it did go before a committee of elders. That was the shocking document. It was the first time when she was about 16 that we realised that what had been going on was not just over-affectionate, but it was actually inappropriate touching and worse. It is common practice for the elders to set up a judicial committee to investigate the allegation. Karen would have to face her abuser once again. It was me and my dad and three elders, plus Mark, all sitting in a little room at the Kingdom Hall um, with the elders saying, right, tell us what he did to you. Wales This Week spoke to the former head of South Wales CID, Wynne Phillips, who now specialises in child protection issues. He stresses that the victim should always be the main priority in any investigation. You can't just assume that a victim will want to face a, a, a perpetrator, a perpetrator, a suspect. I mean, it's, it's very dangerous. These investigations must be victim-based. They must take into consideration the, um, the anxieties, the distress, the feelings of the victim. It was one word against another, and it also hinged on a literal translation from the Bible. They have this two-witness rule which covers everything, so it could be a sm it's that someone smoked, they would have to be seen by two separate people, or it could be that a child has been abused, and would ha that abuse would have to be seen by two separate people. Well, when does anyone ever see a child get abused? It's a paedophile's paradise mm. because of the way the two-witness rule protects the, pe the paedophile, the sex abuser, over and above that of the child. Mark and Cora say the fundamental reasons there's such an issue revolve around the misguided application of the two-witness rule and the instruction that elders must handle accusations internally. The elders do one thing, and they're strictly, they are under strict instruction to do this, and that's to go straight to branch office. Not to the authorities, not to the police. They are under strict instructions to record the event and keep it in the confidential uh, congregation file under a confidentiality uh, clause. And it goes nowhere. I was informed that actually Karen's incident of child abuse was not, it wasn't logged as child abuse because there was only one person saying it, which was her, and so it didn't go any further. Mark and Cora claim that the elders are governed by what is written in a secret manual called Shepherd, the Flock of God. Most elders will deny they even have it. In fact, there, are, there are instructions that they are not to leave it out on a table even for their wives to see. Within that book, it gives very specific instructions on child abuse and how it should be handled by the elders. It's not secret in that um, it's all bad and we don't want people to know about it, but it's probably a secret in that there is it would be on a need-to-know basis and that most of the congregation wouldn't need to know. It says things such as, um, well, how mature are the parents? Mm. Are they spiritually mature? How solid is the child? Where are they coming from? <clears throat> so they're not looking at it from the right angles. They're looking at it from very much a perspective of protecting the organisation first and foremost. They are fundamentally flawed when it comes to protecting the child. And that is very clear, not from our point of view, but from their own literature. Perhaps some more transparency would be a good thing. 
The book tells elders they should never suggest that a victim should not go to the police. It says they should inform victims that it's their personal decision. However, it clearly states this information should only be given if directly asked, and only after guidance has been sought from the branch office or Bethel. Your average man on the street knows if you see somebody doing that, you've, you phone the police. It doesn't have to go to the Bethel all the time. There is only one port of call, I think, when you have allegations of serious crime. That is to the law enforcement agencies. Without the proper um, judicial system being implemented, then it's nigh on impossible to decide on someone's guilt. They have the title of an elder, but they could be a plumber, heating engineer, you know, it could be somebody who does electrics, a uh, window cleaner. They're not trained counsellors or specialists or anything. They're just normal people. Without another witness to back up Karen's allegations, the elders allowed the 53-year-old grandfather to stay in the congregation and Karen was told to keep quiet. If the elders tell you don't talk about this to anyone else, then you do as you're told. It's impressed on you constantly that you must not bring reproach upon Jehovah's name. It's got nothing to do with that at all. It's all to do with how the watchtower looks, this squeaky clean image that they like to have. In desperation, Karen's dad wrote to the Jehovah's UK headquarters in London to ask for advice on what to do next. It was only at this stage that they were finally advised to go to the police. The letter back at that time from the society was very good and very clear. It did encourage in the first paragraph that the victim might want to go to the police. And if the victim didn't, it said the parents perhaps should think about it. And then the third point made was that if the parents and the victim don't, then each elder should search their own conscience as to whether they should go to the police. They didn't, but we did. But without the backing of the organisation, Karen was once again unsuccessful. None of the elders came to the police to back up anything I'd said. So I think because it was literally me against him, um, they just didn't want to take it to court. If you're prepared to die for your flock, I think you should be prepared to come to court for your flock. Just one month later, someone else claimed they had also been attacked. Another lady came forward and she informed me of an incident where she had been raped by Mark Sewell. Eventually, a committee was formed. They would not link the two incidences, so they would not call it a two-witness incident, which Jehovah's Witnesses need, because one was a child and one was an adult. This technicality meant that Sewell had got away with it once again. But this time the decision was taken to remove him from the congregation because of his attitude during the investigation. There would have just been an announcement made from the platform, Mark Sewell is being disfellowshipped, but nobody would have been told why. Being disfellowshipped is an experience which is all too familiar for Mark and Cora. They recall the way they were shunned by their own congregation after they got married for a second time. When someone is disfellowshipped, it's, it leads many to suicide. Mm. And uh, we decided to be there for the announcement. We were very strong. We believed in exactly what we did when we got married. And we went to every single meeting uh, that was there for three years mm. uh, with nobody talking to us, the scorns, the looks. Two years after Sewell had been disfellowshipped, another woman came forward. This time it was someone who worked for him. I was on duty at the back of the Kingdom Hall when a lady who's a not, not a Jehovah's Witness came in crying, very, very upset and annoyed. She made a claim that Mark Sewell had sexually molested her in his car made inappropriate suggestions, and she wanted something done about it. One incident, he um, rubbed his particle up against my backside. Um, other incident, he locked me in a car and asked for sex. Um, he also would ask me uh, to go and sit on his lap, um, give him a kiss. He'd very often come into the office and massage me. Tina Guy was 25 years old and claimed she had been suffering abuse from Sewell for 18 months. But she says her allegations also fell on deaf ears, as she was told that the Jehovah's Witnesses could not do anything about someone who was disfellowshipped. They dismissed anything untoward happened towards me, because they said Mark was just a jovial person, he wasn't actually like that. But they said they would have a word with him and they'd let me know what was going to happen.
Because Mark Saul at that time was disfellowshipped, nothing was done about it because he was not technically a Jehovah's Witness. But this didn't mean he couldn't attend meetings. Sewell would still be able to watch, observe, and the church remained very much part of his life. When you're disfellowship, you're still allowed to attend the meetings. It means that no one is allowed to talk to you. Tina Guy eventually won an employment tribunal against Sewell for sexual harassment. Just one year later, he had been accepted back into the congregation. As part of their campaign, Mark and Cora question the logic behind being reinstated after disfellowshipping merely due to the passing of time. It's not right. It, it, something's not right when, when, when you're being ignored for three years and then suddenly nothing's changed. Alarm bells should have been ringing after more than one person had named the person Mr Sewell. They should have thought, well, hang on, maybe one person, yeah, might get it wrong, but not when two or three. Wales This Week has been told that Sewell soon moved to another congregation in Llantwit Major. It's also understood that the new congregation was not told about the allegations made against him. Karen continued her fight for the next 17 years. It was only when a fourth victim came forward that Sewell finally faced a jury in June this year. But once again, the court heard that the organisation was uncooperative. I know there were letters going back and forth to the Bethel constantly about it. And yet, when the court case um, came up, and obviously the police asked for all the paperwork associated with it, um, they were told that there wasn't any. The Jehovah's Witnesses said the files had been destroyed due to the passage of time. I was told back then that the society did keep um, a list of child abusers because they would need to, because if someone was either confessed to being one or convicted of it, then they would have to inform the congregation where they were, and also if they moved, they would inform the congregation where they moved. I don't see how you could do that without keeping records. With Sewell now firmly behind bars, his victims are looking to hold the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses responsible for what has happened. They did nothing, they offered no support. They let an offender remain quiet in the congregation and nobody was aware of what he was doing, which is why he was able to do so much. Karen is meeting with lawyer Kathleen Hallisey, who specialises in child abuse cases across the UK and the US. Hello. The goal of litigation is to obtain compensation for the victim, um, but also our additional goals as a firm are to try and affect change in organisations to try and protect future victims. The firm is part of a network that recently helped 28-year-old Candice Conti from California win a landmark ruling against the organisation. She won $28 million in damages after she was abused by another Jehovah's Witness at the age of nine years old. The issues are the same, really, in that um, looking to the organisation and saying you're responsible for what's happened here, you had a duty to this person um, and, and you failed to live up to that duty and as a result of that this person has been seriously harmed. I think it's a very difficult fight but I don't think that it's a fight that we can't potentially win. Um, the secrecy is a problem, the lack of documentation presents problems. I don't see Jehovah's Witnesses themselves changing the two witness rule but I do see the government having to make them change in that if the victim's law comes um, to fruition, then legally any um, accusation of child abuse by law would have to be reported to the police by the elders. If there are people out there who feel that they can deal better with these very serious allegations, then we need to be looking at that um, and at, at a government level. The Home Office has ordered a major inquiry into why historic cases of child abuse have been hidden for so long. Now Karen and Auer have called for the Jehovah's Witness organisation to be scrutinised as part of that investigation. The Home Office told us it was still early days and that details of what will and will not be included in the scope of the inquiry will be clearer after the terms of reference are set. Karen and her father are no longer active members of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Karen was disfellowshipped at the age of 18 for having a boyfriend who was not a witness. 
John struggled after he was forbidden from speaking to his daughter as a result. I've had to try and support her and also not have anything to do with her. And they're two extremes. It was about seven years ago when Karen got married. I was actually invited to walk her down the aisle as a proud dad. And because she was disfellowshipped, I knew that I wasn't allowed to do that. But then also, because I knew of what had happened to her in the past, I felt that was one of the occasions I needed to support her. And uh, to cut a long story short, I got into trouble with Jehovah's Witnesses because I walked my daughter down the aisle. Wales This Week asked the Jehovah's Witness organisation to comment on the allegations made in this programme. They did not wish to reply to each individual claim, but did say that they have an absolute and unequivocal abhorrence of child abuse. They work in harmony with the law and do not condone child abuse under any circumstance. They also do not shield from the authorities anyone committing offences of this nature. They went on to say that they support any victim or parent who reports this horrible crime to the authorities and that such authorities have the absolute right to investigate, try and punish criminals. John and Karen do still believe in Jehovah, but they say the secrecy surrounding the witnesses has just become too much. We've lived with lies for 25 years and we don't want any more lies. In relation to the Mark Sewell case specifically, the church claims that he has not been a member of the Barry Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, nor has he been in any position of responsibility for 20 years. They say it is a matter of public record that when allegations of child abuse involving his family members first surfaced, the police were informed and investigated the case. They were also not aware of any congregation or one of its members obstructing police inquiries. Such would be contrary to their beliefs, practices and child safeguarding policy. What they don't say is he was reinstated and has been in the congregation for more than 20 years. So he's been out knocking doors, he's been answering up at meetings. When you want to believe in an organisation and in a faith and you want there to be some closure, you rather hope that now is the time for people to say, do you know what? Perhaps we made mistakes. I've been contacted by so many people who are going through the same thing. People who are just now starting a court process, people who have never told, um, people who had no support. It's so common. And when I think back to how I was treated and I think, oh, if I'd have been treated differently back then, my life would have been totally different.